Hello, and welcome to Please Don't Send Me Into Outer Space, the podcast intent on exploring all that science fiction and fantasy has to offer one movie at a time. My name is Joel. My name is Sarah. Uh, my name is Spencer. The movie this week is Upgrade from 2018, directed by Lee Wanell, written by Lee Wanell, and starring, uh, well, this is Logan Marshall Green, but I was, mm -hmm. pre you, you, okay, it's not Tom Hardy, Logan Marshall Green, Richard Anastasio, and, and, and Asta, Asta, God damn it, Roscoe Campbell, and uh, Richard Cawthorn, let's just go with these people, I don't even know if those are like main people in the movie. Let's see. Uh, I think uh, that's Michael. That's alphabetical. Is, this was the main scumbag, right? Michael M. Foster. No. No. Michael the guy M. with the mustache. Foster. Yeah. Well, he was the main baddie. Yeah. Well, uh, he, at first he was. Oh no! I think you're talking about Benedict Hardy there. Yeah, Benedict Hardy with the mustache. Oh, oh, you're right. Yeah, Benedict Hardy. Yeah, yeah. He has a mustache in his picture right there. I should have known. Yeah. yeah, and the other guy was like a younger, like. Well, who's this dude? Just another goofball. Never mind. He's one of the thugs or something. Mm. Yeah, and Christopher Kirby, the the black guy, was the one of the other muggers. Oh yeah. And um, Fink Cirque was she the was other. She was the detective. Yeah, Betty Gabriel from uh, Get Out also. I was convinced it was the lesbian cop from The Wire at first. Oh. Yeah, yeah. I was really she's actually on Luke Cage. Uh, season two or season one? I don't remember her in season one. She's toward the end of season one. Like, she's... Um, I can't remember. She, like, she's... I think she's only in two episodes, and she just comes in. It's, it's like, totally, uh, Kida. I think that's her name, right? I... Uh, Kiba? Kiba. Kiba from The Wire? Yeah, Kiba from The Wire. That's all Yeah. But she's... I mean, she doesn't have a big role or anything. She's just, okay. like, crocking down, cracking down. Luke Cage doing this. No, he was set up. The movie this week is Luke Cage, season one. From no, <laughs> you guys know Lee Wanell. Yeah, from Saw and I. Did he do anything with uh, Conjuring, or is that just James Wan? I don't think he's the Conjuring, but he he plays the a character in Insidious. He's one of the uh, oh the glasses guy. Yeah, one of the ghost detectives. I'll call him uh, Specs. <laughs> Mm hmm. That's what it says it is. Yeah. I was. Just <laughs> There's an episode of uh, We Hate Movies where they're talking about the first Saw movie, and me and Sarah were just listening to it, and they're just bitching about Lee Wan L because he wasn't like, you know, he'd been in the Saw short film, but mm -hmm. he wasn't like an actor, actor. And I think he, I think he's fine. You know, he's not doing major roles in uh, Insidious and stuff like that. No. I, I think I, was, I think the first saw is fine. It's interesting, but it goes on too long. I uh, I remember when I saw it, that movie. We're not talking about upgrade yet. We're talking no. about saw. <laughs> Although it's kind of similar with the the violence. Oh yeah, this this had some of that Bloomhouse touch of like yeah some some real bad like. Body horror. St I mean, not body horror because it's not like all about that. But like, they don't shy away from showing you bad things just happened. Oh no! To go off on another movie tangent, we just watched Annihilation again last night because we got the Blu-ray for cheap, and uh, mm -hmm. that had a whole bunch of like super violent things that I forgot about. <laughs> hmm. So uh, upgrade. It's. Kind of in theaters now. We 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 basically people. We were going to record about this like the weekend it came out, and uh, we kind of got mixed up with a whole bunch of other things going on. But uh, you can still see it. It's it's still got to be out there, probably in the cheap theater now. Yeah, kind of. Uh, uh, as far as I know, didn't do well in the U.S. Well, I feel like 
I mean, I, I saw a trailer for it, but I feel like I didn't see anything else going on. Like, it wasn't heavily promoted. Yeah, uh, I, I mean, on TV, I saw, saw some trailers. I didn't know about it until I just randomly on YouTube saw, like, on the side thing of, you might want to... You might like this, and it was a, the trailer from uh, South by Southwest or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, that looks pretty cool, but that will never play near me, and it did. And oh, cool! An, and I was one of two people in the theater, and it was like the Tuesday after it it uh, premiered. I think uh, there there weren't that many people in the theater. There was enough people where somebody in front of me had their phone out, and I went up and scared the crap out of them on accident. But, uh, yeah, otherwise, do you remember where we first saw this thing? Because I don't even know, like, we were both like, oh, yeah, we need to go see that after seeing the trailer. I think we saw the trailer for it before something else, like... Yeah, I'm trying to remember. Maybe before, like, Blockers or something, or... Oh, yeah, we saw that movie in the theater. Or, um, what else did we see not that long ago? (sighs) Solo? It could have been before Solo. Yeah. yeah. I've, mm. But anyway, it w- we got like one, we saw it like one time. Hmm. And we thought it looked kind of entertaining from the, tra- the trailer. and um, Yeah, it looked futuristic and stuff. I 100% thought it was Tom Hardy. Which is oh. funny because that just happened recently when we watched uh, Spider-Man mm-hmm. as yeah. well. <laughs> And I think it's the same actor. Yeah, Logan Marshall Green. He doesn't even have like a big role in Spider-Man: Homecoming. But Sarah's like, "Oh man, Tom Hardy." I guess this is like a pre, you know, his prequel to the character he's going to play in Venom. I thought maybe he was supposed to be Tom Hardy's brother, and then Tom Hardy was going to be Venom in the Venom movie. I didn't know, but this guy just kind of looks like him, in my opinion. Yeah, I thought it was Tom Hardy doing a real bad American accent. <laughs> and then I learned, oh, <laughs> this is someone else who is actually American. <laughs> it's just a regular guy doing a bad American accent. Who's from America? Yeah, that's a popular face structure right now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, with the hair and the beard and the face. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I didn't think it was a... Uh, looked similar to Venom, but apparently some people thought it was a trailer to Venom. Well, I mean, like, have you seen the Venom trailer? Yeah, but it didn't look like it to me. Like, the Venom I trailer mean, had Venom in it. Yes, that's the difference, I think. Because it's basically about a guy who ends up with a alternate personality connected to him that gives him superpowers. And what's Upgrade about? <laughs> well, it's about more it's than about that. A, it's about an operating system that comes to, like... Starts, like, using his body. Right, but imagine if that operating system was an alien. Uh. Who did motorcycle tricks. I think that, I think people might have thought that if they didn't know what Venom was. (laughs) Or, like, if they kind of, like, I don't know. Maybe they were just like, oh, yeah, that Tom Hardy movie where there's, like, another thing inside of Hmm. him. Yeah, another voice. I guess. Wait, does... This is uh, about Venom in the comics, so you would know. Does Venom, like, does a symbiote, symbiote whatever, talk to its its host? Uh, like, it, I mean, it can, and it, it in, but I think it works on instincts unless it's like, because what they do is they merge personalities most of the time, and so it's like a we are Venom type thing. Hmm. So. I don't think, I don't remember Venom being like a literal separate separate entity that could like speak. Mm -hmm. I remember it being like a, I mean, it is a separate entity, but I think it, like I said, it works on instincts for feeding and like fighting. Okay. I mean, here's the real difference between Upgrade and Venom. Upgrade is like, I would like to take over your actions for you if you'll give me permission. And Venom is like... I would like to bring you back. No, okay, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Macho Man Randy Savage or something. Anyways, uh, to actually talk about this movie, uh, did you like it, Spencer? Uh, yeah. I, I, uh, I really did enjoy it. Once I loved it, there are definitely some problems with it, but I really, 
uh, I, it really caught me off guard was just how good it turned out to be. Yeah, I agree. Watchability on this was like super easy. Yeah, I don't want to, maybe I shouldn't go into comparisons yet, but what do you think? I think a casual comparison is okay. Yeah. Because we're not, maybe I mean, like, obviously we're not in the spoil se- spoiler section. We'll, we'll right. give it a few more minutes. I mean, I felt like it was as watchable as something like Taken or something, mm. where it's an action movie that you don't need that much information to go on. And yeah, like I would totally rewatch this, even though it it didn't seem very cumbersome in any way with like what the story was. It was like really accessible. I uh, I I on Facebook I compared it to I call it Blade Runner if it was directed by Walter Hill. So it's like those kind of big sci-fi like I uh, idea for a future, but. Like Walter Hill, where it's super stripped down and just bare bones. Yeah, it's almost like I mean, this is not. I don't. I don't like this. Like Ma- Michael Bay movies, mm-hmm. but you know how when you see a Michael Bay movie, you're just like, okay, like here's the ride. I'm gonna watch this. Like you kind of. There wasn't any thing too challenging for a viewer just coming in without any information. And it was entertaining. It was super entertaining. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I liked it a lot also. I think that uh, the story is kind of generic. And, and like I, I knew how it was going to end up being at the end. But that is, I don't think the story is the strong part of the movie. It's the visuals, the fighting, uh, the the world, I guess, is interesting. They, they you know, to, to spoil one thing, it does kind of get left open for a part two. So yeah. I would be interested in seeing more in this world. Uh, I really liked how they were, it, you know, the, I'm used to fighting scenes done in the U.S. doing a lot of quick cutting mm-hmm. and, you know, fancy uh, camera angles to, to make it like an impact shot rather than actually watching two professionals like fight each other. And I'm not saying Logan Marshall Green is a professional fighter. I'm pretty Mm -hmm. sure he's not. But they shot it in a way where he was doing almost, you know, Jackie Chan style, you know, kung fu stuff with dodging and, and, you know, quick moves to, like, deflect something and hurt somebody real bad. And, you know, that's that's cool enough on its own. But I really liked the camera things that they were doing, too, because when he... In in the movie, if you watch the trailer, he lets the computer take over whenever he uh, gets in a situation where he does have to do like hand to hand combat, and there were like the ch- the camera ch- uh, style changes so that you're you're almost like on this axis or, or not axis uh, axis yeah a a x i s yeah and <laughs> it's yeah it, I don't know how to explain it properly, but it does this. Thing was like he gets up and it, and it's like uh, aligned with his line with his spine in the camera like it follows him up. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there's there's that shot where he's doing these like backflips and like the camera's doing the spin with him, which I thought was really cool. Yeah, it's, it's action scenes that you could actually follow yeah. in an American action movie, which with a lot of mainstream ones, uh, you can't. Yeah, I don't know if it was, like, the, the choreography was just done really well. That's all I can assume. Because, like, if you watch a Scott Atkins movie, that's that's a great martial artist. Like, he, he knows how to do his stuff. But he's not usually fighting. Like, there will be one other martial artist that he'll go mm-hmm. up against. Uh, most of the time, it's a bunch of scrubs. And that's, the, you know, the, like, oh, he knocks a couple of people out. Camera angle changes. Knocks another person out. That kind of stuff. And uh, I appreciated the, the nod to the kung fu stuff going on here. Yeah, I appreciate in a good uh, fight choreography this period cuz uh just like I said earlier there's a lot of American movies you just don't get a uh, good choreography at all. It's just like it doesn't feel like the uh, American actors want to go through the process of like training and actually showing off the skill instead of a lot of time, like a Marvel movie, it's just a lot of fast cuts and CGI. It seems like uh, to me that the 
the issue isn't necessarily that people... The, the fight scenes are always kind of lame in movies where they... They seem kind of meandering sometimes and messy. Like, they're not really um, entertaining to watch the way it would be if you were actually watching a fight. It's Yeah, it seems weird. But I think that the issue is the blocking and the camera angles. Like, I feel like in this movie, the camera is really a huge part of why the fights look awesome. And also just the choreography is so seamless that it's, yeah, I agree, really, really well done and kind of reminded me of like Wushu or something that, yeah, that's really graceful and quick and kind of magic looking. I, I, I don't know about you two, but I cry at the end of the movie because I found it just so upsetting and like I was pretty uh, on board with uh with uh, the lead character, Gray, which is that's a stupid name, but I was on board with him from early on because like when you, when you see him, it's not a spoiler because you know it you know in the beginning he gets uh, if you read the synopsis you know he gets uh, paralyzed from the neck down, but um uh like this him adjusting to life where he can't use the rest of his body was incredibly heartbreaking in a way I did not expect. Like an action movie like this to uh, to affect me, like to the level of like seriousness. Yeah, yeah. Like this, how like it's 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 just like that Walter Hill type of filmmaking I was talking about earlier, where it's just so stripped down and simplistic, and you just see basic aspects of life, and he that he can't they can't do anymore because he's stuck in a wheelchair, and it's just like in. He does, he like uh, Logan Marshall Green does some real incredible, just like, like uh, despair acting at, like despair and anger, just what with his, with being like unable to live, yeah, like, live like he used to be able to. Yeah, I want to get into that. I think we should uh, just say let's let's hop into spoilers. Okay, uh, let's uh, every all three of us recommend this movie. Yeah. In if, general. It's, if it's still playing near you, uh, go see it because uh, it should be seen. Yeah. yeah, it's worth seeing on the big screen and it's entertaining. And a uh, warning if you're sensitive to like actual depictions of violence, it, do, it does have some pretty, <laughs> some hardcore. No uh, holds barred. Yeah, like uh, you don't you don't flush away or you don't, the camera doesn't turn away. It's rated R for a reason. And it yeah. does like, yeah, extreme stuff. Yep. I, I looked away, luckily, for a couple of spots in it, but I would have been pretty disturbed by some visuals if I hadn't, so just yeah. putting that out there. All right, spoilers from here on out. Okay, so that part, yeah, that part where he has no hope, mm -hmm. and, you know, he's gone out of the hospital, everyone's telling, you know, his mother's trying to take care of him. And he slowly has the computer distribute more of the sleeping medication to him. Uh, mm -hmm. That was so real and heartbreaking. Yeah, this. Yeah, uh, not to bring up work like I tend to do a lot, but it reminds me of some <laughs> of the residents who are stuck in like wheelchairs who are paralyzed. It and like I kind of see that type of uh, that like hopelessness. Every time at work, to an extent, not not this bad, uh, but like I still see aspects of it in residents, and like that just really, really got to me. Like where he has to be fed and everything, and it's like, God, he like he can't, he's lost everything. Like yeah. it's not just his his wife and uh, like his job. Like he has truly lost absolutely everything because he can't even use his body. Yeah. Yeah. Right, there's there's that part of the trailer where he's like, "Yeah, I know this must be hard for a man who's used to working with his hands." That's I, that's putting it. That's like the understatement of all time. Exactly. <laughs> you feel terrible for him. They didn't have to really establish the character that much either beforehand. No. Yeah, like he's first seen fixing the car in his garage, and like dressed like this, like a. Like like a uh, is grease monkey the term? 
Yes. <laughs> yeah. Like, like quickly, you know, like, oh, he's an old fashioned guy who likes to work, who likes to work with his hands. He doesn't like technology because then you see his wife come home in like a super fancy future car. Car drives itself. It talks yeah. to her. Yeah. The the fun the interesting thing I I thought in the movie is that it's not everybody who's like plugged into that kind of you know super technology future like his wife is because you see plenty of normal looking you know cars out on the road and everything and every once in a while you'll see the super futuristic thing so it's like the technology is there there's been advances but it's not like the super future yeah it's it's not Blade Runner or something like yeah, that yeah it's like a class seems. More like if you're rich, you can afford it. If you're not rich, then you're not uh, a part of this world. Yeah, exactly. Because they, like when they have their major crash, the the catalyst uh, catalyst for the action points of the movie, they, when their car flips over, they they flip over at a tent city. So it's like all these homeless people are, are living there. It, it's still like regular world. It made it very relatable that way the division between class when they were when they were ending up in that part of town was kind of like um like cosmopolis or like um something like i don't know demolition man or something i do like the idea of the future being like something close to what we have with maybe some different casing over it maybe some like modifications but like having like the real gritty like life that we see now still there in some neighborhoods or whatever i think that was a really cool way to build the world and um gray it's his old neighborhood so you know he came up from uh, he married up basically like it's never explicitly said but like you get to get the feeling oh he he kind of got lucky and married a woman who either came from money or was going to uh, become rich. Yeah. When he said that, I was absolutely sure that it was going to turn out to be like some old vendetta that was done. Like people were waiting for him. Mm -hmm. And he was, you know, a gang gangster back in the day or something like that. But it's uh, the, the story's kind of dumb that way. Like, um, I understand why he like the you know, like I'm just gonna spoil it straight up here like the the chip with its own sentience got the rich guy to arrange for him to be uh, in a car accident or not even in a car accident because the one of the bad guys actually paralyzes him after the car accident. And uh, so that he can have a body. And, like, I don't... The the motivation that's weak is, like, why did they kill the wife? Um, The guy says he kind of did it for fun. Right. I mean, he also says it's like, oh, we're of a different kind now, you know, and she was going to hold you back. Uh, I don't know. I just took it as they were being extra violent just because they wanted to. Yeah, I think they were pretty mean, like, um, in general, but I think that it probably was an incentive for him to take the chip, having, like, nothing else positive in his life. That's true. Yeah, I mean, it was a case of fridging. Uh, Is it called fridging? Yeah, Yeah, fridging, 100%. Yeah, but at the same time, I, I don't know, like, it's... It's not great, but I, I'm still kind of fine with it in this case. Because, like, the, the three the three guys you know are, like, the three guys, they uh, are very awful and this horrible, violent people. So, it, it, so it's, it's almost justified in that way. Like, you know, like, they genuinely enjoy, uh, like, what they do. I mean, you know, if I had a gun for an arm, I might also become a super violent person. That's just, uh, <laughs> that's some dumb technology. Yeah. Gun arm. I don't know that's going to come in handy in, you know, the regular world. I thought that was a cool idea. I didn't like how, you know, th- that definitely meant there was going to be more violence, but it was interesting. I'd never seen that before. I just kind of, uh, 
I liked the fact that I wasn't imagining, like, the circumstances. Because when they first get into the car accident, it's kind of, like, fast-paced. The story Mm. is, like, bang, 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 and you're in a situation where his wife has just been killed and he's in a wheelchair, like, really quickly. Yeah. And without much explanation. And um, I liked that I wasn't outside of myself thinking, like, oh, I wonder... Like, if this is happening or if that's going to happen. The movie was entertaining enough that I wasn't imagining what it could be. And I think that that made it more enjoyable for me. I was trying to figure it out the whole time. I was. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean like, I, I really enjoyed the movie, even so. Because it, it was it was surprising me. Like, when the wife gets shot and stuff like that, and then later... Um, what's the name of the computer? Uh, STEM. STEM. STEM is like... Did you notice when he when he shot her, he didn't have a gun in his hand? I was like, oh my god! Did one of the one of the police a drone sniper or something like that? Is this like a big conspiracy? Like he shot out of his hand? I'm like, oh, he's Mega Man. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. Uh, what did you think of the three the three uh, dudes who were who were in on it? Because I yeah. really liked the guy with the mustache. He, I thought he was a really compelling villain. Yeah, I liked that guy. I liked um they they were just really mean. Like they they you believe that they're bad guys from their actions. <laughs> There's no like real questioning of it. But um the other guy, I yeah, if we'll get to that in a minute. I remember thinking this guy is a weenie or something. <laughs> Which later makes more sense, but in the beginning, I'm like, um, why is he in this situation with him? Which one are you talking about? The creator of the chip. Oh, the guy, yeah, the blonde guy who oh. didn't want to leave his house. Yeah. Yeah, I I genuinely thought that was Justin Bieber when he first showed up. <laughs> he's definitely going for that look. <laughs> and he's got his own cloud. Yeah, a little, cloudy. Yeah, a literal cloud. Mm-hmm. So is he supposed to be like a Steve Jobs type? I guess. Uh, I mean, he he wants to be a behind the scenes person. Like he he's like afraid to be seen in public and stuff like that. I don't know who that's like because Steve Jobs was obviously a spokesperson yeah. and a salesman. I think ideas person more than a technology genius. Like he had that also, but like the the thing that made him remarkable that the world you know stood up and noticed was that he would you know stand on stage and and put on a show basically. Yeah, yeah I guess. I, I, this guy I, is like uh, it felt it felt too specific. Like it had to be based off of either one person or a couple of people. It's possible to to go back to the the guy the mustache guy. <laughs> As I'm going to refer to him, Fisk. you did you think that he uh, was specifically modeled after a certain type of person? Uh, who was? Why are you getting at? Uh, I'm talking about you know the kind of person that is white and carefully parts his hair and grows a little mustache like that and wears a button-up shirt and might be seen carrying a tiki torch. He looks like a hmm. hipster to me. I mean, he was <laughs> he was paired with a black man. Yeah, I'm not saying that he actually was. I'm just saying that his look. Uh, yeah, I feel like the look may have inspired. Oh yeah, the polo shirt too. Okay, yeah. There's a picture of him uh, <laughs> on his IMDb of him in Hacksaw Ridge. He's got the exact same look, so I'm not. <laughs> that kind of makes it a little more. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it might have just been a coincidence, but to me, it felt like we're kind of be like, uh, that's, see, when you said the person looked like a weenie, that's who I thought you were talking about. That guy kind of looks like a somebody you wouldn't even give a second glance to. I think this guy looks like he would be going to get some artisan cheese and, like, <laughs> yeah. suspenders in Portland or something. Yeah, I can see that. But, but what I like about that character was... He was the most unassuming of the three of the three like goons, but he uh-huh. was the most uh, violent and the most horrible of the three. 
True. Like, I and um, the moment when he um, sneezes and he kills yeah. that guy with oh, like the the man yeah. in that moment that's kind of both stupid and brilliant. Like, yeah, that made me go like, okay, this guy is a really cool villain. Like I could watch him just kind of be this like cool, chill like assassin for a whole movie. Yeah, yeah. Probably been doing it before, and then they did this whole big uh, like show thing for this one job that paralyzed that guy, and that like ended their career. That's that's probably what he normally did, like hit yeah. assassinations and whatever with his group. Like it felt that- like it felt like there's a history with those three guys of they're just like the go to goons for the 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 whatever company that was. There was a guy in the beginning, too, when he goes into the house. I don't know if that guy was involved or if he was just a guy that lived there with them. But... He was the third guy. Uh, oh. Yeah. Well, there were four, there were four guys. Because there was the, the guy at the bar. Yeah. There was the, the guy, the first guy he goes to that Sarah's talking about, who, uh-huh. who lives, like, at a... In the neighborhood, In a crappy yeah. house. Mm-hmm. And then uh, there was clean cut guy, mm-hmm. and then there was another guy with clean cut guy that also had the oh, gun yeah. arm. Oh yeah, he's like, uh, well, uh, he killed him on the roof. Yeah, he gets murdered horribly, right? Okay. <laughs> By his own gun, right? Yeah, like yeah. he blows off his own. Like he makes him blow off his own head. Yep, watermelon. Yeah, there was another. There was like a few bad guys that were like the the goons that went to go deal with stuff and then it seemed to me like the hierarchy of the bad guys was that they were all answering to the blonde like Steve Jobs guy or whatever <laughs> Steve yeah. well, Justin, <laughs> boss man. Yeah. Justin Bieber Justin Bieber guy yeah <laughs> Bieber, Bieber Jobs and I was like this guy is completely non-threatening to me like even when he was talking about things in a serious way and I think yeah, I was just, like, going along with the movie, not trying to necessarily figure anything out. But I was like, hmm, this guy as a, like, bad guy? I'm not sure about. Like, he, but, like he seems too aw- like too awkward to hold any power over another human. Right. Right. Well, I mean, in the movie, it turns out that he's not really... Yeah, that's the, the, the thing, thing at the right? end. He's being manipulated by his own creation. Yeah, yeah, that's what makes it make more sense at the end. But and he's like even trying to stop it, at, at you know, by hacking it and stuff like that. But there's yeah. hacking in this movie. Yeah, he's hacking. There's hackers. Not to mention that one hacker. <laughs> that you should not assume the gender of. Yeah. And I like um, that uh, Gray didn't even care about that. She because. Uh, the the Jamie was, was this, assumed that Gray would care about gender, and he was just like, "No, I just need some help." Yeah. Yep. Like in person help? I don't think so. That's that. Yeah, I could get. I get that. <laughs> uh, running your whole VR life farm thing. People had like IVs, didn't they? Yeah, yeah they were like. They were like. Well, they were in diapers. Out. They looked like they were yeah. in a heroin den or something. Like opium? Yeah, opium yeah. den. But it was kind of Matrixy too. Like, kind of like the hackers of the future. It looked like a rundown version of Ready Player One. Yeah, yeah, totally. I could see that. Oh, that's who that guy is. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, I feel like... The setup for the movie is pretty, like, clean and quick. And then there's the really quickly he meets the detective lady that is kind of looking into what happened to his wife. Yeah, like, she, uh, she's trying to look into it, but the, because STEM is involved, uh, it's complicating everything, assumably. And but she catches on to what Gray is doing pretty quickly, and it, it's just a nice twist on like the cop character isn't stupid. Like she is aware that 
something strange is happening. Yeah, and I yeah. like I like uh, how dogged she was about just like stopping by uh, to see Gray and be uh, just trying to catch him uh, off guard. And I forgot what she saw, but she she finds some some sign of uh, like of something fishy after I think when she goes to visit him the first time in the garage. Yeah, she. Oh right, well, yeah. What, what do you mean? Because uh, when they when she went to go investigate the house after he kills that one guy, she says that they find engine oil on the steps, like in in like a boot print. It's like, well, who would be working on old cars? Only one person, apparently. I guess it was the boot print, but I remember she saw something in the garage. Yeah. Well, she tries to buy the car off him, and he's like, no. And I get it that there can be sentimental reasons for wanting to hold on to a vehicle. My dad's disabled and he keeps some of his old motorcycles and stuff. Like, even if he feels like he can't ride them, it's like sentimental attachment or whatever. Mm -hmm. Like, sometimes you just want to keep something, but she kind of makes it seem like you don't have any use for it anymore. Yeah, she's just she's just testing the law. She's like getting trying to get him to slip up and stuff like that. And he probably would have slipped up if Stem hadn't been like, She's testing you. She's yeah. going to She's got a gun. Oh no. No, I don't know. Uh this movie also has that kind of like commentary. Mm-hmm. It strikes me almost as libertarian. Uh <laughs> where it's like mass <laughs> really? mass surveillance <laughs> everywhere mm-hmm. and yet the cops can't still catch the bad guys. Hmm. It's like, oh, there's drones and people like they track him because everyone is trackable and stuff like that. It's like, yeah, but bad guys can still like hack that and and, uh, get it blocked. And, you know, they can make it so their faces are automatically blurred by the cameras and stuff like that. It's like, but there's surveillance everywhere. Yeah, but humans would still figure out a way to sneak around it. What I'm saying is we need less government oversight now. <laughs> the thing that I noticed that she noticed afterwards is like that his wheelchair <laughs> his mm-hmm. wheelchair was left at the bar. I mean that's how does it happen? <laughs> He's like, "Oh, somebody they mugged him stole my wheelchair and then a, a nice person like put me in a cab or something." Also a guy got killed. Yeah. I mean, it could be a coincidence. Everywhere he's going, guys just happen to get murdered. Yeah. It seems like it'd be a really hard secret to keep if you were a, a paralyzed mm, and you could really, yeah, if you were, and you could really do all this crazy stuff that nobody else could do, that seems like it would be a hard thing to to act out. Yeah, and, and in this, and, and in go, this case, uh, she figures out. Uh, that you know he's kind of lying. Yeah, well, if quickly. it wasn't for his damn mother poking <laughs> her nose into his business. Yeah, but mom, uh, leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I like that this uh, kind of takes a vigilante type uh, story, and it's like, oh, actually, uh, you'd be found out pretty quickly <laughs> because oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, presumably this doesn't. Like, it doesn't seem to take that long overall. It feels like less than a week. Definitely. And Yeah. Yeah, and, like, in this case, it's like, yeah, of course, if you just went out, like, to be like uh, Charles Bronson in Death Wish, you would be caught. You would be, uh, uh, police would catch on pretty quickly because they're kind of professionals and they're trained, uh, you know, to track this type of behavior. Right, you're not trained in special espionage like Liam Neeson was in Taken, so you're going to make mistakes, even with a voice in there telling you what kind of issues could pop up. Like the like, you, there's just some some things that can't be accounted for without experience. Right. So, uh, do you want to talk about the first fight? Uh, yeah, sure. What do you want to say about it? Um, because I think the most important part is the ending. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, I like that uh, when he goes into the house, uh, like the, the the voice that the stem immediately is like, uh, "Go over there, so look at the, uh, the the screen. Go over there, hide behind this." 
And the then, table, Michael. <laughs> it, yeah. It's like that part in the Matrix when he's like first being guided through the cubicles or something. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, I liked that too. <laughs> On your left. No, your other left. <laughs> <laughs> and the fight is pretty cool. And then uh, it gets real gruesome because he kind of gives him a Chelsea grin that almost cuts off his head. Yeah. Uh, my uh, what's what's the name? Gray. Yeah. You know, Gray is already out of control because he's given full control to Stem to do it. So he's doing all the fighting and everything like that. And then they end up getting knives, and he's he's smacking this guy around with a knife and stuff like that. And he has him down on the ground, and he's like, Stem, we need to stop this right now. And Stem's like, okay. So he takes that as an order to kill the guy, <laughs> and which is him taking a butcher's knife and putting it into his mouth and pulling back. And you see it all. Yeah, I, I didn't like that. I felt like they were trying to impress upon you what the, what this could do. Well, like, it capable, what it was yeah. capable yeah. of, and how quick it could happen, and how easy it would be. To just, like, kill other people, like, super easy. And they definitely illustrated that, but I I kind of was like, uh, anytime we talk about, like, stomping on someone's head or cutting it in half, not I don't really like that, but it's okay. I mean, I get it. It's a violent movie, and it, it was... It was fun, and I I was glad I didn't focus on it <laughs> right at that moment very much. Yeah, I, yeah. I I'm not squeamish to on screen violence or gore, but that's one of the rare times where it actually got to me. Yeah, yeah, I have more of a problem with mouth trauma stuff than I do with with a lot of other things. Like like people, you know, have specific like eye trauma, ear trauma, nose, you know, those mm-hmm. things that like, oh, I don't like that. For some reason it's like if somebody's like pulling out somebody's teeth, I'm I'm out of here. Mm-hmm. You know? mm-hmm. This this is like the ultimate uh oh. If yeah. I hadn't when we went to see Drive, I remember feeling like it was like a slap in the face. I was like so shocked by the violence. I wasn't expecting it. We saw it in the theater, and I was like, oh, my God, there was, like, no warning or anything. Now I think because, like, I've seen Drive, like, I'm like, okay, yeah, I get it. It's a violent movie. and It could happen. It could said. happen in a movie <laughs> now. Like, But it did kind of remind me of that, like, shock I had when mm. I first saw that. Yeah, and, uh, and, and the aftermath of the, well, like, uh, before the, the final blow, like, uh, He's it's 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 like they're trying to force some humor where he's like apologizing and trying to like not kill him and it's, and it just felt kind of awkward there where it's like it it, it like it, Lee Wanell didn't do a good job of mixing tones there I think it just it just felt kind of flav like kind of pick comedy or like violence it's not really working and then after he kills them there's there's this moment of him freaking out and it to me it felt unearned well i mean look at looking at it from his aspect i think he did does actually do a good logan marshall green does mm-hmm. a good job of like being plain shocked while he's the one obviously doing all the choreography and stuff like that mm-hmm. like it's it it does almost feel like his head is of its own independent thing. Like, no, no, no. Like shaking it back and forth and mm-hmm. his eyes wide open. Like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. I don't want this. It's like he's puppeted and he does a really good job of pretending to be puppeted. Yeah. I, I like to imagine that scene from the aspect of the guy who was getting the, the <laughs> beaten out of him. Mm-hmm. And being like, this guy keeps talking to himself. What is, <laughs> he's creeping me out. I just want him to go. <laughs> I just, <laughs> A lot of a lot of yelling, like he's what? What is wrong with him? <laughs> yeah, I um to go to the next uh, brutal murder scene. I I really enjoyed the whole bar bit. I I love the uh, the decoration of the bar, which was like bones <laughs> and skulls everywhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's for hard people, okay? <laughs> yeah, and when you first see a bar, it's like, oh, this is cartoonishly yet. Uh, it, it, like it's cartoonish how like like rough the bar is, but it's also kind of uh, appropriate too. Yeah, it paints it paints a picture. <laughs> 
And it, like that adds to the ridiculousness of him, you know, just rolling in there straight up to the to the bar and being like, I'll take a whiskey. And then the guy sitting at the bar, hey, buddy, help me out here. Put a straw in there. You know, just sipping on it and then making his big like announcement like if anybody knows blah 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 you need to tell me right now or you're going to be in trouble and then they take him to the bathroom where I assumed sex was going to happen but that didn't happen so don't worry people I do kind of get like a cheap like I don't know like just excitement out of the idea of being uh, underestimated and a, sometimes in these action movies, too, it's really fun. But it is a trope, and it happens a lot, where somebody is, like, you know, in a super weak, like, underdog position, and then, like, they just kick ass. <laughs> and uh, in this situation, it's pretty, like, the epitome of, like, a weak person showing up and then, like, completely destroying them. There were two people in that room, weren't there? Uh, I think there was more than two. Yeah, I think it was, it was, it was, in the bathroom. Yeah, it was a black guy and uh, like three or three or four guys he was hanging out with. They, yeah, they were going to murder him. That was super violent too. Yeah, I'm trying to remember what like I remember him like messing around with him with his knife and stuff like that, but I don't remember anything specific like gross happening. Um like yeah, pulls of pulls of blood peering underneath him, but he's yeah. kind of gilding the lily like, like his face is like, oh my God, I can't believe I've done this like type thing. His acting is like in shock that he did that. Yeah. And he's like, he'll tell you what you want to hear now. And that's that, right. Yeah, and that's when Justin Bieber is starting to Shut down stem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yep, deactivate his stem. And there, uh, before that happens, there's that whole montage after he kills the first guy where uh, Bieber and him are talking. Is like, I never intended for you to use this this way, and like, and I could take it away at any instant if you're committing crimes and blah blah blah. And they they kind of do like a storytelling montage that mm-hmm. felt really sloppy. But like I said, the story isn't. The the cool part about the movie, it's just kind of, uh, you know, what's going on. Yeah. Uh, like that, I like that uh, when you get to the, the scientist kid, like, uh, lecturing him, that's when he's like, oh, okay, it's like a it's like a version of a Frankenstein story. But then you get, like, a twist where it's, uh, where it's a Frankenstein story, but it uh, goes deeper than than you would think. Yeah, I think that the sci-fi-ness of it, like, adds something. It has this, like, I guess it's the technology that adds something different. Like, but it it definitely kind of feels like a low-budget movie in another way, and I really like that. It feels like it was, like, an idea that had enough funding to do certain things and certain special effects, but it also feels real. It feels like kind of like based in the skeleton of reality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's like uh, with the whole class thing that they're commenting on. And like the whole thing of like some people have analog cars. Some people have the fancy cars and like the the uh, dispersion of like who has technology and who doesn't really uh, leads into the whole like... It's like Star Wars. It's a dirty future. Like it's not like super super shiny. It's it feels actually lived in. Right. It's more realistic as to what it would be like. Like everything wouldn't be instantly cleaned up. Like Queen Abadala's planet, Naboo. It'd be more like uh, whatever Solo was at. Uh, what's that called? Coruscant. 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 Something like that. Anyway, you know who this, uh, that stem voice, that cold, calculated stem voice, it's mm-hmm. very HAL 9000, now that I think about it. Eh? We yeah. went to see 2001 for Joel's birthday down at the Arclight in Hollywood yesterday. Ooh. It was awesome. It was, that was not playing anywhere near me. Was that the Christopher Nolan thing? Uh, I don't know. It's the, it, whatever the road show is, yeah. where they're actually showing the 70 millimeter film yeah, version. Yeah, the... Uh, 
unedited what would they call it is there some some fancy word that means like it's the original like film print oh i can't remember what like unedited or something like that where they yeah christopher nolan like wanted to show the real version I mean, it's the same version I've seen <laughs> other places. <Yeah. laughs> the only other version I think that's out there is the one that Steven Soderbergh like edited, which I didn't watch because hmm. why would you edit a perfect movie, Steven Soderbergh? I don't know. Answer me. No. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, the the whole uh, showdown, like him, like his body getting shut down and having to like crawl thing, that mm-hmm. was done really well. The camera's doing a lot of cool things there too. Yeah. Like dragging along with him. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of those shots could have been done with these cameras that people wear on their bodies with like an arm and that the camera just like moves with them on the arm following them. Yeah, they could digitally mm-hmm. take out the arm. Yeah. Yeah. Or even like out of shot have it. But I think that it does make it look pretty otherworldly in a couple spots in this movie. It's yeah. impressive. I never saw that um, Hardcore Henry movie, but it seems uh, like... It's a better idea than a movie, because uh, after about half an hour, you're like, oh, there's an hour left of this? <laughs> it it kind of gets old pretty That's fast. Funny. And there's yeah. a really uh, off-putting gay joke later, later on that's like, why was it there? But it's a Russian director, so who knows? I think this was better. This seems like the same idea to me, even though I didn't see the movie. Like, more of, like, this person has, like, more abilities than other people do. And he's been, like, upgraded. Hence the title. <laughs> and yeah. um, Oh, that's what it was. Yeah, they're talking about upgrading his um, system. Okay. <laughs> Makes sense now. But, um... Uh, uh, yeah, I I think that they executed this pretty well. Same idea of like a camera following along with like action and action. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can see that. But this was actually consistently good. Hardcore Henry, <laughs> yeah, yeah, is the, you could do an episode on it, but I don't. I don't think. Oh, any does it take place in the future? It's technically science fiction. It I gets see. Into like Bioshock. Uh, infinite type territory oh, oh they're all racist uh no there's like a, a sky uh uh science lab thing oh segment that's like it's pretty cool and it's like oh will home movie be like this oh no and, yeah well the- yeah I, i'd be afraid of motion sickness which not, didn't used to be a problem but as i get older like sometimes the thing will just be like whoa i wasn't expecting that and Sarah definitely has issues with that. So, yeah, but um, I, I believe around this point when he's crawling to to Jamie's uh, apartment uh, to get fixed, he now the Fisk and the other guy who I forgot the other who the other guy was. Uh, they show up to the bar, and the and the bar guy is like, like yes, yeah, so things just got crazy. I couldn't stop it, and then. Uh, Fista sneezes, and you get just the the fakest sneeze anyone's ever seen. Yeah, and uh, you see the like, super zoom in on these like clearly CGI like uh, like nano uh, nano uh, machines that kind of go into his brain and uh, kind of rip up his brain, presumably from the inside. And yeah, you can only assume what's going on, and it's. As I said earlier, it's kind of stupid, but it, but it's really cool at the same time. Like I, yeah, I really it like that. It, it, it is. Uh, it's an interesting scene. It doesn't come back into the movie, although uh, it does. That lame guy goes like, "I could kill you with a sneeze," but that's about it. No, no, no the no. Gu- the. No, during the fight, Stem says, "Stem uh, says, move your head or something," because he's about to sneeze in his face. Micro machines. Oh, I didn't realize that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is it called? Airborne something. I don't know what he says, but he like has a name for what it is. Yeah, no, he says micro machines. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He says, no. You're gonna get a nose full. You just kill everything. Say, well, you're gonna come out. <laughs> I can't remember. What it was. I can't do a micro machines thing. 
I think that's, uh, <laughs> I don't know if that's, you know what uh, the hell we're talking about, Spencer. Yeah, the guy from the commercial from the 80s, I guess. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the guy who would talk really fast. He's like an auctioneer or something. Yeah. <laughs> it worked. I had to get me some micro machines. Sorry. Yeah, I I thought that was kind of cool. Like if it was going to be if it was it was done like subtly enough and mm-hmm. quickly enough that I think if they had tried to really like harp on that and use it a ton of times again, it could have been stupid, but I think that they it was okay. I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. Yeah, and I like- moved on without really questioning it. Yeah, and uh, I like the little moment of the uh, of Gray telling, uh, that's like leaving his uh, uh, his wheelchair there, and the guy in, a, in the other wheelchair is like fake, and then gets in his <laughs> other wheelchair. Stands up, yeah, exactly. He like stands up too. That guy's been doing it for years. Or do you think he just does it with his arms? No, uh, I think that he was supposed to be. Pre- yeah. He was like pretending on Berlin. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you see him like stand up and walk over there. Yep. But then I like that whole thing of you see like VR is just like in Ready, Ready Player One is like is this thing escape from a terrible world? Where in this case it was poverty, and like this like this one specific area, which like where Gray lives, presumably that doesn't really happen but like in this very impoverished area like you see people just addicted to vr and diapers just like with the uh, feeding tubes in them you gotta say the world gets any that's not not too bad an idea just yeah. stick a vr on my head i'm just glad that it doesn't get too serious most of the time in the movie it does hit on some Real life issues, I think that. Yeah, it's subtly. It's just kind yeah. of if you if you pay attention, it's right. there. You can like I feel like, well, barely anyone saw it, but if people did, so I feel like pr- probably would pick up on it. If yeah. any, if anything it has like the opposite message I'm used to hearing, which is like you need to unplug and see the real world, and more like, uh, you can understand why people do this, like. There's a massive amount of pain and suffering out here, and people need to be able to escape, and like even for a second. And you shouldn't judge them for needing to be able to unplug from real life for a, a little bit of time. Yeah. Like those those people in the VR helmets were the extreme cases, but yeah. I feel like that is kind of a thing you can apply to everyone who complains about people always looking at their phones. Like, right? Uh, sometimes uh, the world's overwhelming. Yeah, <laughs> that's kind of how I feel about the end part too. I feel like there are probably people alive right now that would rather that circumstance than some of the things they're enduring. Not to be like super dark, but <laughs> well, the movie gets very dark. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't even have to talk about like he has another fight scene after after escaping from the building and getting. Uh, he gets his chip hacked so that uh, rich guy can't uh, stop him. Stop him anymore. And from that point on, he goes and takes out the other blonde guy. The cop finds out that he's running around. She tries to stop him. Yeah, and he uh, uh, gets in a car chase, and he has to actually use his skill as, uh, as a driver. Yeah, like with driving, because he because Stem can't hack the car, and then Stem act manages to hack a car, and uh, there's a whole uh like a uh, showdown in the, at the lab, and you learn Stem was behind the behind all of it, and Stem basically throughout the movie, Stem is saying like uh trying to like giving him like bs uh like advice of like you need to stay calm you need to like not uh uh break down mentally which was just, yep. which was just a ploy to uh, encourage him to break down mentally right then he and can- another thing that happened is when they when they went to the hacker and had them do that thing that gave stem the full control to activate whenever it needed to although mm-hmm. of course he doesn't tell gray that yeah, it felt it felt like um, 
Stem Stem's kind of, you know, he's a sentient computer that makes choices. And, like, at this point, it's, like, Skynet or whatever you want to compare it to that has, like, control over many, many things. Yeah. And then mm-hmm. he's just kind of, like... It feels like the guy, the Justin Bieber guy, has been saying, like, this is a legal liability for me, and this is worth tons of money. And Nobody's supposed like, to know nobody, about this it. Is a, this is a gift and, like, a demo, like, test for me, and, like, nobody else is going to know about this or be able to use it. And, like, throughout the story, STEM is starting to, like, assert itself more. Like, initially, it's surprising to hear, like, it has its own ideas and stuff, and then more and more you start to see, like, he's not asking permission as much, and he's not, or it is asking, you know, is just doing what it wants to do. And then, yeah, at the end, it's like... Spencer, this one affected you. Tell us what happens there. (laughs) Well, uh, Stem, well, you get, you see what appears to be it oh it was all a dream ending where it's gray in the hospital he, he's hugging his wife and you know she survived and he survived and then uh he cut back to reality and stem has taken full control of their bo- of gray's body and he took out uh fisk and all the other guys because they I think Stem said like they were weak or like becoming and too like too sympathetic to, to to humans or something along those lines and uh kills the Justin Bieber guy, kills the cop, and this kinda walks off and it's like, oh wow, humanity yeah. is kind of The bad guy wins in this one. <laughs> and yeah. it was just so upsetting that it it really made me cry. So I'm not laughing at you crying. I'm just like, yeah. At the ending, yeah. No, it it was unexpected. I kind of respected the movie for having the balls to do it, though. Or the whatever you want to say. (laughs) Sorry if that's crass. The the, (laughs) the microchips. Having the microchips to do it, yeah. The the sentience. You don't want to gender the movie, so, you know, which is, yeah, the microchips, (laughs) obviously. And just, uh... Yeah, I planned on going to GameStop afterwards to get Fallout Upgraded? 4. Oh. You know, and I was crying so much, I was like, I have to go home. I can't I can't <laughs> compose myself enough oh my to, to go get Fallout 4. I went I'm a couple sorry. days ago. I, I really like the movie. It, I just found it weirdly touching and the whole... Uh, I don't know. Like I, I didn't expect it to be just... I think it's great, but it's... I, like my only problems would be some of the dialogue is kind of uh, hokey and forced a bit. Yeah, and I think some of the tone shifts are a little off and strange. And like Leo Anel, uh, I think in this case he's a better writer than director. I haven't seen Insidious Chapter Three, but I hear the Insidious sequels aren't really worth it. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I heard that too. The first Insidious is good. It's a fun movie. Right, but that's James Wan directed, so Yeah, it's James Wan, so he he got the power. Yeah, I don't um I, I think that if there's flaws in the movie it's that it's not really an original concept. Like even that ending is not original, but I don't know. I, I don't want to spoil a movie that potentially people haven't seen. Uh, to say what it is. It actually is, a. Uh, now I think about a couple of different movies that it's like, uh-huh. Uh, I think that it's so well done, like, with the cinematography, the choreography, like, the the pacing and everything like that. It's, it's one of the rare movies that, like, you don't really have to worry. Now, I'm not telling you to shut your brain off the door because I hate it when people say that. Because... Uh, let me think, please. It's okay. <laughs> I, I'm allowed to criticize things that I think are worth criticizing. And but this movie makes it like it's just it's just a click fun done. Yeah. You know, bummer of an ending, but it doesn't really matter because the whole ride was there. I uh, I kind of liked the ending. 
even though I thought it was really, really sad. Did you watch, um, spoiler for American Crime Story? Did you watch American Crime Story? Um, I don't, is that the thing that was the OJ trial? Yeah, they did an OJ trial and they did the assassination of, uh, uh of, uh, Versace. Gianni Versace. Gianni Versace. Uh, no, I haven't watched those, but I don't, okay. I don't care about those, so I can be spoiled. Really? Yeah, I'm not going to watch those. Okay, hello everybody listening. I'm going to spoil something from uh, Assassination of Gianni Versace, American Crime Story. <laughs> there's this moment where in American Crime Story, there's a really nice person who has been kidnapped by the killer. And he has been trying to make things right and convince him to do the right thing. Um, and basically there's this moment where he walks into a house and he sees his father there and you know, like at that second that he's dead and like that hit me harder for some reason, like that he wanted that, like that moment was like the same. I get what you're saying. It's like that moment of being like, Oh, like, excuse me. There is no hope, like, this is done, you know? But they did it in a way that made it seem pleasant, like they were going home or something. And I I think that it's cool that the bad guy wins sometimes in movies, but I feel like it is sad. It is sad that he hasn't been given any free will and he's basically in prison now for the rest of his life, like, in his own head. But I think that... I think it's sedated him enough that he at least isn't in anguish. But it, it, it's obviously not an ideal situation when somebody, like, takes your freedom away and your mind and everything. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very powerful ending uh, to a movie that kind of... I don't know, I, like, I, I, it was marketed poorly because I feel like the whoever... Blumhouse produced it, but whoever else uh, had hand in, I feel like they they probably were like this, like this. Uh, is this is something that most people probably won't be interested in because of just how poorly it was marketed, and so it kind of has a veneer of oh, it's just kind of a stupid action movie, but it's not just a stupid action movie. It's a really like really cool throwback to like a late seventies, eight, like early eighties, like John Carpenter or, or Walter Hill movie. Right. Just, you know, science fictionized. Like it's kinda like Escape from New York esque. And that like this like this whole like super stripped down bare bones like gritty violent story. Yeah, very uh you know, and then some uh precinct uh, or assault on precinct thirteen kind of stuff thing going Although on no, with the violence level. Although no child gets shot in the chest in that one. In this they one. They didn't in my version they did. Okay. Because they got the wrong ice cream flavor and they had <laughs> the the microchips to complain about it. Yep. My god. I think it's kind of a unique way to let the bad guy win. I mean a terrible way, but at the same time, more unique than some other movies how they end um it feels like a twist because you've kind of been faked out beforehand yeah i didn't see that coming i i like i thought fisk was like the ultimate like bad guy i didn't expect uh stem to be like the they be to like how have this whole conspiracy like set yeah. up yeah it almost feels like Rosemary's Baby, almost, with, like, the whole, it's a conspiracy that everyone is in on, kind of. Yeah. It's, like, with a much smaller cast, and it's not, like, vague European, like, nature devil worship stuff. <laughs> you spoiled that movie now. <laughs> Spoiler alert. The movie is 50 years old. 40 years old, however old it is. Uh, who knows? It's old. <laughs> All right, let's wrap this up. I'm going to read the outro stuff. You guys think of a lesson you learned from Upgrade, the movie all about PC repair. It was a good movie. 
It was a good movie. And uh, you should watch it. There <laughs> are serious parts in it that, yeah, I feel like they can be emotional. I think I felt worse for him when he first got hurt than I did at the end. But it is emotional. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't have any problem with the tones. Like even the funny parts, I didn't. I didn't have an issue mm. with. You know, it's it felt kind of like a horror comedy thing going on with the action, obviously. Yeah. But and drama, you know, it was it was everything you could want in a movie without being a musical. Yeah. There was a song in it though. What was that song? There was. I don't remember. What? Uh, Is it like a pop song? It was yes. I don't think I think it was an older song. I can't remember. Anyway, lesson or not lessons, <laughs> outro. <laughs> hey, listener, if you have any suggestions or comments, write into please don't podcast at gmail dot com or message us on Facebook, facebook dot com slash pdsmios. If you subscribe to us on iTunes, we'd appreciate it if you left us a rating, a star rating, or a written rating, any kind of rating. That would be great. We haven't got one of those in a long time. Probably because I alienated all of our listeners by saying that All Dogs Go to Heaven is actually kind of okay. If you want to hear more podcasts just like us, I suggest you listen to High and Low, a Kurosawa podcast starring Spencer Seams as the movie genius and Joel Torres as the guy who happens to also be on it. A movie genius? Oh, thanks, I guess. That's you. Yeah, I mean, we've had guests who are, are, are better geniuses than me. Uh, let's not talk about those. Uh, okay. we, we are impressive. You and I are okay. impressive. And that's that's available on uh, Podbean, so all the regular iTunes and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, we're actually nearing the end of that. Uh, it'll be finished probably by the end of the year, right? Uh, January, mid-January, last episode. Okay. Yeah, not too many episodes left. So if there's Japanese movies you love... You could check out all that stuff on our other podcast, High and Low, a Kurosawa. Uh, Kura. What's the name of the guy? Kura. Uh, uh, Kurosawa. Kurosawa. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Kurosawa. <Kura. laughs> Akira. Not the anime. Uh, forever. Not gonna die forever. Yes. Okay. And, uh, of course, if we are part of the Ear Trumpet Audio Network at eartrumpetaudio.com. Lots of good stuff there. You guys got a lesson that you learned from Upgrade? Hmm. Besides, uh, never trust a computer that talks to you, Siri. Uh, I was going to say never trust a Justin Bieber. <laughs> or somebody trying to look like him. Yeah. It will lead to some bad, uh, bad choices later on. They're definitely 0 for 2. I feel like... Um don't trust automated cars in this in this movie. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah, in this movie. I think this it's trying to sow some like mistrust into society. Like, see if you got automated cars, people are gonna hack them and everyone will die. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, I don't know. I was just agreeing with you because sometimes I get tired of questioning. <laughs> 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 Sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, what's your lesson? My lesson is that... To get serious, love those you have while you have them. Oh, man. Mm, deep. Uh, if you live in a house with automatic things that take voice commands, you should have an automatic lock installed on your door so your mother can't come in and catch you. Standing around when you're supposed to be paralyzed. Yeah. That's my lesson. Thanks for being on, Spencer. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, do, I, I have a blog and stuff. Oh, yeah. Tell us. Well, plug your stuff here if you want to. Okay. It's called uh, Jailhouse 701, Japanese cult cinema. Uh, I go through Japanese cult films slash any Japanese films I feel like going through, basically. And right now I'm doing a Sunny Chiba retrospective called uh, Chiba Checkup. Cause I haven't seen many Sunny Chiba movies. He's the guy from Kill Bill Volume 1 who gives uh, Uma Thurman the sword. And uh, he's a legendary uh, action star in Japan and worldwide. And um, I covered one movie that 
could uh, you guys could talk about. It's called GI Samurai. It's a two hour, two and a half hour uh, epic action movie where this squadron of uh, Japanese military self defense force goes back in time and with tanks and a helicopter and machine guns and they kind of fight samurai and there's a 30 minute battle scene that's pretty cool where samurai almost defeat a tank and wow uh, yeah it's the action choreography is very good there's time travel it kind of comments on the nature of violence and war uh you know it's a it's a good little i did a review of it it's on dvd it's not streaming anywhere because outside of Japan, no one kind of cares about it. But uh, yeah, so I review stuff like that or this like old pinky violence movies or like weird anime. Just whatever I feel like going through. And I was on Flixwise Canada talking about the uh, African film The Rot from 2006. A revenge movie that kind of takes a turn into uh, something completely different. Awesome. That's it. What what was the blog address again? Uh, Jailhouse 701, Japanese cult cinema. Sounds good. Cool. Sarah, you want to plug your blog? Just kidding. (laughs) Do you want to say anything about it? (laughs) Um, Yeah, okay. I'm an artist. Uh, I do uh, visual art, mostly watercolor paintings. And... um, my Instagram is Sarah Kathleen Roberts, and my website is sarahkathleenroberts.com. If you're interested, check it out. Mm. And if you want to see my nudes, uh, they're not <laughs> they're not available. So don't even don't even write in about that. Uh, we'll see you next week, folks. Thanks for listening. Bye. Thanks. Bye. See ya. See ya. EarTrumpetAudio.com Ideas and entertainment. Loud and clear.